social, political, and economic factors. Studying this history enables us to better understand the relationship between historical classifications, the evolution of these concepts, and their contemporary use in federal statistics. This data viz enables you to see how the race and ethnicity categories on the census have changed throughout the decade, including for the 2020 census. Within the context of the U.S. decennial census, the questions and concepts of race and ethnicity follow the standards set forth by OMB. OMB minimum categories for data on race and ethnicity for federal statistics, program administrative reporting, and civil rights compliance reporting are defined as follows. OMB requires two minimum categories for data on ethnicity, Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino, and they require five minimum categories for race, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and white, and respondents may report multiple races. And the Census Bureau is also required by Congress to use the category some other race. The race and ethnicity question format designs for the 2020 census adhere to the 1997 OMB race and ethnicity standards. You can see the 2020 census questions on this slide. The Census Bureau did not use a combined question format for collecting race and ethnicity, as the OMB standards require the use of two separate questions for ethnicity and race for self-response. While a separate Middle Eastern or North Africa or MENA response category was not included, detailed MENA responses were elicited, collected, and coded. Per the 1997 OMB standards, MENA responses were classified as part of the white racial category. While the Census Bureau tested an alternative questionnaire design in 2015, we must ultimately follow the 1997 OMB standards and use two separate questions to collect data on race and ethnicity. Our testing, however, did show that we could make improvements to the 2020 Census race and ethnicity questions within these OMB guidelines. And overall, several significant changes were made for the 2020 census questions on race and ethnicity. So I'll talk about some reporting of multiple responses and how they're collected and tabulated. In response to the question on race, which instructs respondents to mark one or more boxes and print origins, some respondents will report multiple race groups, such as white and black, to indicate their heritage. These represent the reporting of two or more responses across major race categories. This also applies to the reporting of detailed responses across major categories, such as reporting both German, which is classified as white, following the OMB standards, and African-American, which is classified as black, following the OMB standards. The goal of the instruction to mark one or more boxes and print origins is to help respondents understand that they're able to report multiple identities to represent their heritage. In a related but different way, some respondents will report multiple detailed groups to represent their multiple identities. For example, someone may report that they're both Native Hawaiian and Samoan. These multiple detailed Pacific Islander responses are collected and they'll be used to tabulate the total counts of detailed Pacific Islander groups. But they reflect a singular racial identity as both groups are classified as part of the Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander racial category. In a similar fashion, whether marked as a checkbox or written in multiple responses within a category such as Marshallese or Fijian, constitute multiple origins but a single race. The 2010 census used a complex series of coding rules to determine how to prioritize and assign up to two codes for each unique text string. In 2010, if more than two groups were part of a write-in text string on the same line in the race question, we prioritize coding race groups over Hispanic origin groups or other types of responses because we were limited to only coding two responses within one write-in line. In the 2020 census, our subject matter experts, they coded what they saw, coding up to six responses from left to right, regardless of race group or Hispanic origin, enabling all responses to be treated equally. The examples on this slide illustrate this coding change. In this third example, a response of Hispanic, white, and Chinese was coded as white and Chinese in 2010 because of the prioritization of race responses over Hispanic origin responses when there were two, more than two responses in a single write-in line. In 2020, however, all three of those responses were coded. And in the last example, a response of Spanish, Mexican, Samoan, and Chamorro were only coded as Samoan and Chamorro in 2010, 
and their responses as Spanish and Mexican were not coded when in the race question because of the prioritization of race responses over Hispanic responses when there were more than two responses in a write-in line. In 2020, all four of these responses were coded. On this slide, we can see how this improvement to the coding rules impacts the final data by recognizing the rich and complex detailed identities reported by respondents. Let's look at the example write-in response of Cuban Thai Filipino. In 2010, even though Cuban was written first, shown in the green text, the responses of Thai and Filipino were prioritized over Cuban because they were detailed race groups. Cuban was not coded or included in race tabulations because the two race groups were prioritized over it in coding. The redistricting data tabulates major race groups, so this response was tabulated as part of the Asian race category, representing the two responses of Thai and Filipino in 2010. In 2020, however, all three groups in the write-in response were coded, and the tabulation would be for Asian, representing Thai and Filipino, and some other race representing the Cuban response. We improve the ways that we process the data and code the responses to these questions. These improvements and changes enable a more thorough and accurate depiction of how people self-identify, yielding a more accurate portrait of how people report their Hispanic origin and race within the context of a two separate questions format. These changes reveal that the U.S. population is much more multiracial and more racially and ethnically diverse than what we measured in the past. We are confident the differences in the overall racial distributions are largely due to improvements in the design of the two separate questions for race data collection and processing, as well as demographic changes over the past 10 years. We're also confident, as shown in our research over the past decade, that using a single combined question for race and ethnicity in the decennial census would ultimately yield an even more accurate portrait of how the U.S. population self-identifies, especially for people who self-identify as multiracial or multi-ethnic. The 2020 census illuminates the racial and ethnic composition of the United States. The first component, as shown on this slide, is for ethnicity statistics, which come for the question on Hispanic or Latino origin. From these data, we know that the Hispanic or Latino population numbered 62.1 million in 2020. We have the second component of this composition for racial statistics, which come from that separate question on race that I mentioned. To frame the discussion on racial composition, we use the concepts of race alone, race in combination, and race alone or in combination. And these concepts have been in place since the 2000 census, and they're central to understanding our country's changing demographics. The 2020 census provides a new snapshot of the racial and ethnic composition of this country, and we'll take a look at that in the next few slides. The two or more races population, which we refer to as the multiracial population, was measured at 33.8 million people in 2020. And in this next series of slides, We'll walk through how the in combination multiracial population for all of the race groups accounted for the most of the overall change in each racial category. Although the white alone population decreased by 8.6% since 2010, the white in combination population saw a 316% change during that same period. The Black or African American alone population grew 5.6% since 2010 while the Black or African American in combination population grew 88.7%. Over the past 10 years, the American Indian and Alaska Native in combination population increased by 160%. And the Asian alone population grew through 35.5% between 2010 and 2020, while in comparison, the Asian in combination population grew 55.5% since 2010. The Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander alone population grew by 27.8% over the past 10 years, while in comparison, the Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander in combination population grew faster at 30.8% since 2010. And the sum of the race and combination population changed 733% since 2010. It's important to note that these comparisons between 2020 and 2010 census race data 
do need to be made with caution, taking into account the improvements that we've been made that we made to the Hispanic origin and race questions to our data processing and also the ways that we code what people tell us, which I described earlier. Accordingly, data from the 2020 census do show different but reasonable and expected distributions from the 2010 census for the white alone population, the some other race alone population alone or in combination population, and the multiracial population, especially for people who self-identify as both white and some other race. In the 2020 census, the largest multiracial combinations were the white and some other race population at 19.3 million, the white and American Indian Alaska Native population at 4 million, the white and Black or African American population at 3.1 million, the white and Asian population at 2.7 million, and the Black or African American and some other race population at 1 million. In table P1 of the redistricting data, population counts are available for every possible multiracial combination a respondent could report in the 2020 census race question. On the screen, you can see an example of this table shown at the national level, and the data are available for geographies down to the census block level. You can access these data for your state, your county, your city, or your town, and even for your neighborhood on data.census.gov. To provide an overall summary and the guiding framework, we discussed the 2020 census results in our America Counts stories, which provide an overview of race and ethnicity in the United States. We're confident that differences in the overall racial distributions are largely due to the improvements we've made to the two separate questions for race data collection, processing, as well as demographic changes over the past 10 years. And the re results are not surprising as they align with our expert research and corresponding findings this past decade about the impacts of question format and race and ethnicity reporting. And these improvements more accurately illustrate the richness and complexity of how people identify their race and ethnicity in response to the separate questions within the current OMB standards. We're also confident, as shown in our research, that using a single combined question for race and ethnicity would ultimately yield an even more accurate portrait of how the US population self-identifies especially for people who self-identify as multiracial or multi-ethnic. So Nicholas, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some other ways we can look at that multiracial population. Great. Thank you, Rachel, for that great overview. Uh, there's really a lot of important information available from the 2020 census, and the work that Rachel's done has really helped us to understand more about our country's racial and ethnic composition in a new light, particularly with all the improvements that we made to the coding and the data processing. Um, Rachel, if you don't mind, would you continue sharing your screen or do you want me to switch over to mine? No, I'm happy to do it. Okay, great. Thank you. So in this slide, what we have is an America Count story that's a companion piece to the data that Rachel talked about and that we discussed on August 12th. We conducted other analyses to illustrate how the 2020 census results allow us to measure our nation's racial and ethnic diversity and how it varies at different geographic levels. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the second half of the presentation getting into how we explored multiple measures of racial and ethnic diversity. And for these measures, we cross-tabulate the race and the Hispanic origin statistics, as data users and the media and the public often do, with our 2020 census redistricting table P2. And what we see here is that the results are not as impacted by race reporting patterns of Hispanic or Latino respondents. And so therefore, we're really confident that the changes we see in diversity measures, which look at mutually exclusive Hispanic origin by race groups, reflect actual demographic changes in the population over the past 10 years, as well as the improvements that we talked about for our question designs, data processing, and for coding. So another way to understand the results from the 2020 census is to see how all racial and ethnic groups are distributed across the country and how this informs our understanding of diversity. We know that some people have different perceptions of what it means for a population to be diverse. Our definition for diversity refers to the representation and the relative size of different racial and ethnic groups within a population. Diversity is maximized when all groups are represented in an area and they have equal shares of the population. So we've used several approaches to measure racial and ethnic diversity in the United States. These include a diversity index, prevalence rankings and diffusion scores, 
and a series of prevalence maps. And so I'm going to show you some of these measures in the next few minutes and talk about the results from 2020. So to set the stage, the next slide presents a state level map, in this case, using data from the 2010 census. So looking back to 2010, we see the geographic distribution of the diversity index from state to state across the country. The states shown in dark green were more diverse with a diversity index score of 65.0 or more in 2010. The states shown in light green were less diverse. The diversity index measure tells us the probability that two people chosen at random from a given geographic area, in this case a state, will be from different race and ethnicity groups. Now we have a map calculating the diversity index for the 2020 census. In 2020, at the national level, there was a 61.1% chance that two people chosen at random were from different race and ethnicity groups. This is higher than 2010 when the diversity index was 54.9%. In general, the states with the highest diversity index scores are in the 2020 census in the West, Hawaii, California, and Nevada, in the South with Maryland and Texas, along with the District of Columbia, a state equivalent, and in the Northeast, New York and New Jersey. You can see here in 2020, Hawaii had the highest diversity index at 76%, followed by California, 69.7%, and Nevada was 68.8%. We'll give you some connections to tools that you can drill down and find our interactive Tableau data visualizations on the diversity index, and those are available on our website, census.gov. The next measure of diversity that I'll talk about is a series of prevalence ranking graphics. So these graphics show the percentage of the population that falls into the largest or most prevalent racial or ethnic group, the second most prevalent group, and the third most prevalent group. In the graphic, the colors of the bars represent the different racial and ethnic groups shown in the legend. So the orange bars in column one show us that for most states in the country, the white alone non-Hispanic population was the most prevalent racial or ethnic group. Except for the states of California, Hawaii, New Mexico, and the District of Columbia, as well as Puerto Rico. When we look to another perspective, in 2020, we see the Hispanic or Latino population shown in green became the largest or most prevalent racial or ethnic group in California, comprising 39.4% of the total population. Black or African-American non-Hispanic shown in blue was the second most prevalent group in the District of Columbia. Asian non-Hispanic shown in red was the most prevalent group in Hawaii. And the Hispanic or Latino population was also the most prevalent group in New Mexico and in Puerto Rico. So looking at the next image, one of the highlights that I wanted to point out here were shifts in the second most prevalent group in the United States by state. These are the second column in the graphic. What's interesting here for the multiracial population it is now the second most prevalent group in the state of West Virginia. This is shown in teal at 4%. In Wisconsin, we see that the second most prevalent group was Hispanic or Latino, Texas, the first and second most prevalent groups didn't change, but the size difference between white alone non-Hispanic in orange and Hispanic or Latino in green shrank to about a half percent. It was also interesting that in DC, the difference in the size of the black or African-American and the white populations narrowed dramatically to only a 2.9 percentage point difference down from 15% difference uh, 10 years ago. So as another measure for diversity, we look at the diffusion score. And this is the far right side of the graphic. The diffusion score measures the percentage of the population that's not in the first, second, or third largest groups combined. This really tells us how diverse and unconcentrated the population is relative to the largest groups. We saw that Hawaii was the state with the highest diffusion score, followed by Alaska, Oklahoma, and Nevada. And then we'll turn to some measures for prevalence maps. These show geographic distributions and patterns in racial and ethnic diversity across the country. So the first map displayed here shows us the most prevalent race or ethnicity group by county for 2020. The white alone non-Hispanic population shown in orange was the most prevalent group in about 90% of counties. In the South, the black or African-American non-Hispanic population shown in blue. Hispanic or Latino shown in green was most prevalent in counties in the Southwest and West. And in addition, you can see the purple counties for American Indian and Alaska Native 
show that it was the most prevalent in counties in Alaska, the Four Corners region, and the Upper Great Plains. So there's a much more interesting variation shown in this second map, which shows us the second most prevalent racial or ethnic group. I'm gonna highlight some of the uh, interesting findings for the multiracial population. But first we see that there really are uh, patterns here that are not as tightly clustered in specific regions. And this is also an inverse relationship quite often to the most prevalent map that we showed first. Hispanic or Latino shown in green was the second most prevalent group spanning the entire continental US in large numbers of counties in every region. The multiracial population shown here in teal was the second most prevalent group in many counties throughout the northern part of the country. So I'm gonna highlight that a little bit more by going to the next slide. These screenshots from our data viz, which you can interact with online, illustrate how you can focus in on various population groups such as the multiracial non-Hispanic population and easily compare the results in a visual manner. So this is that same map, but showing data from 2010. This shows us the counties across the country in 2010, where the multiracial non-Hispanic population was the second most prevalent group. When we flip the map to data from the 2020 census, we see how many more counties across the country had the multiracial non-Hispanic population as the second most prevalent group in that county. Now I've got one more highlight to show you, just to encourage you to dive into the data for yourself. This map of counties in the state of California shows the percent of the population in each county that identified as multiracial. And I think you'll find Southern California stands out. So as the country's grown, we've continued to evolve in how we measure the race and ethnicity of people who live here. We use different approaches to illustrate the complexities of measuring racial and ethnic diversity across time and at different geographic levels. And you can read about the statistics for your state, your county, as well as other areas across the country in our America Count stories that we referenced in the presentation. The improvements we made for 2020 yield a more accurate portrait of how people self-identify in response to two separate questions on Hispanic origin and on race. And to help you explore the data, we've included a list of useful links to access the 2020 census race ethnicity statistics. There's some user-friendly data visualizations uh, that we pointed to. There's also data gems, which are short videos that'll walk you through how to access the data. And we also have a 2020 census redistricting data files press kit, which has many, many more resources all consolidated in one location. So we know we've uh, tried to give you a lot of information in a short amount of time, but we hope that it really helps to whet your appetite to dig into the results for yourself. And we'd be happy to answer all the questions that you have and talk about other things that may be on your mind tonight. Thanks so much. Oh, that is super. I have actually really enjoyed, uh, I didn't think I'd say this, but the, you know, the interactive information on your website. So thank you for making it so user-friendly. Um, and I, I encourage folks to take a look at the website. Uh, the work that you both have done in your uh, in the the departments that you work at uh, has been really incredible. Um, I, I can tell you love data, and uh, <laughs> and so I'm giving it back. And yes, yes. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here in the chat that I'd uh, that we're encouraging folks to uh, reach out if you have any questions. Uh, I'll pull them out as as we go along. Um, there's someone who's asking, or uh, I, let's see here. So I'm seeing that in 2010, when I filled out the uh, filled out African American, European American, and First Nation American tribe noted, only two of those answers were counted. Uh, anyone have? Uh, response for? Sure. One of the things that we'll point out is that it really, it really depends on the specific responses that you gave us, whether they were checkboxes, write-ins, or a combination of checkboxes and write-ins. And we can talk about probably all day long about various scenarios. But one of the points that we made was that when a write-in was provided, we were only able to code up to two codes per write-in line 10 years ago. We expanded that for 2020 to enable us to code up to six, which gave us one slot for every single group that could be tabulated following those major categories that we have. So it would depend if you check the box, label black, black or African-American, if you wrote in all three of those on the same line, the difference between 2010 and 2020 is if all of those terms were on one line, one thing that would have happened 10 years ago is we only saw the first 30 characters of that response. 
So that would cut off somewhere around African American, European American, and we actually wouldn't see that third segment of that person's identity. In 2020, we coded up to 200 characters. So we saw all of that information and more, and we coded all three of those responses. So I hope the, that helps to answer that question. Thank you, it absolutely does. I know uh, not only there's so many folks on this uh, Zoom that I see that uh, their work is around you know, race and identity. And um, so I, 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 you know, want to take this time, like, I feel like we've been heard uh, there. I know there's still some challenges and, um, you know, folks can continue to, you know, work with their organizations and, and see about if there's any other challenges. And I'm, I'll let you uh, let us know how to let, you know, make those kind of concerns or challenges that folks are facing uh, known. Um, but I do want to ask the next question is, is there also a uh, comparison of these changes and results due to increased response rates, either from the improved outreach and collection efforts or other strategies, especially among tribal nations and communities that speak, Engl uh, speak languages other than English? That's a great question, too. I think a lot of this could be really understood by looking at some of our research over the past decade. So as Rachel pointed out very early on in the presentation, the Census Bureau has been collecting data every decade since the nation's founding. But the ways in which the questions have been asked or the categories have been presented, or even the ways that enumerators observed who you were rather than you telling the Census Bureau who you were has changed over time. But one of the things that we did over the past decade was to do a lot of outreach, focus groups, qualitative work, quantitative studies to understand how we could improve these questions so that people would be easier in their sense of understanding what we're asking, knowing why we're asking, and then making changes that allowed them to really self-identify who they are. Uh, we also did work with multiple languages to try and understand some of these concepts and how they're understood. I'll say, and I'll be honest here, it's not a perfect question. It's not the question that we thought might be on the census in 2020, but the improvements we made have really helped us to see in more fine detail all of these realities that people are telling us about who they are and in many more complex and multiracial and diverse ways. So uh, we can point you to some of that information uh, afterwards as a follow-up to look at some of that research from the last decade. Perfect. Uh, I'll, this will be our last one for this uh, section here. Uh, why would Cuban, in the example shown, be coded as some other race when it is an ethnicity. Rachel, could you talk about this and also give some context mm -hmm. from uh, the coding work and also the work that we did for the question design and uh, bringing this into a nutshell? Yeah, this is a really good question. And the important thing to, to think about when we talk about why is Cuban or any other Hispanic response coded as some other race is that this is, we're coding as some other race in the, when it's a response to the race question. Um, you know, this is in the context of the two separate questions. So, you know, when we receive a Hispanic origin response in response to the Hispanic origin question, it will be get a code for Hispanic origin, and that response will be counted as part of the Hispanic or Latino population. When we move to the race question, when we get a response there that's a Hispanic response, whether it's um, you know something like has, someone just says they're Hispanic or they're Latino, or they provide a more detailed response, then we have to classify it as part of the some other race category. And this is a response to following the OMB standards, which state that Hispanic or Latino responses can be any race. Um, so that that's really why we code the these responses in the race question as part of the some other race category. And, and you can see when you look at the data um, and you look at the some other race category that you know the majority of respondents in the some other race category are people who are Hispanic or Latino. Um, and so you know and that really is the function of the two separate questions. Thank you so much. And I, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, talking about this question. It brought up, you know, some of the work that Thomas does uh, with uh, the Latinos of mixed ancestry or Loma. Uh, Thomas, we'd like to bring you in at this section and kind of talk about maybe some of the challenges or uh, the work that you've done as well in this area um, and see if you know. 
folks, uh, I'm sure it resonates with some of the folks on this call. Right. You can hear me all right, is that okay? All right, great. Hey, Sonia, thank you very much. And thank you very much to Nicholas and Rachel for your presentation. The visualization tools that are now available to us are just amazing, unheard of compared to what was available and what you had to do before. So I can definitely see myself spending quite a bit of time <laughs> just playing with these numbers and slicing the data all kinds of different ways. So it's very exciting. I could I, I almost make a new career out of this. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Thomas Lopez. I'm the treasurer of MASK, and I've been part of MASK for many, many years. I'm involved in the multiracial community, the multiracial movement for, gosh, probably 30 years now. And I like to think of the multiracial movement, the modern multiracial movement, beginning in the early 80s, um, especially with the formation of a group called I-Pride, which stood for Interracial, Interracial Intercultural Pride in Berkeley. And throughout the following decade of the 80s, many other groups started popping up all around the country. Mask began as early as 1986. And from pretty much the very beginning, uh, these groups were very concerned with how multiracial people were going to be counted and identified. And we focused very much on the census as being the premier data collection and reporting uh, institution. And what we discovered, though, and what became uh, pretty obvious is that it wasn't actually the Census Bureau that determines these categories. As was stated in the presentation, it's actually the OMB or Office of Management and Budget who sets what they call the statistical directives for, for racial data collection. And so these groups such as MASK and iPRIDE and others all across the country started getting together and defining each other and finally coalescing in 1989-90 to create an umbrella organization called AMIA or the Association of Multi-Ethnic Americans. And throughout the 90s or the early part of the 90s, along with other groups across the country, doing various efforts at the state level, local level, with their local school districts, et cetera, there was this, I don't wanna call it lobbying advocacy campaign, it's probably a better term, to try and raise awareness and try and create some sort of change at the federal level to allow people to somehow express multiracial identity. There was letter writing campaigns to representatives. There were uh, people such as one of the founders of Mass, Levon Gatti, who went and testified before Congress to try and advocate for changes at the federal level. Because what happens is when the OMB decides to make a change, it trickles down to all levels of government. Because anybody who then reports data up to the federal government has to adopt the methodology that the OMB sets. So really, if you can get it at the federal level, then it pretty much trickles down eventually to uh, all the different levels of government. And there have been whole books that have written, been written on this subject. So I could really spend a long time talking about the full history here, but we don't have that time, unfortunately, and I want to keep my comments short. Suffice it to say that in 1997 is when we had our victory in, with the OMB deciding to allow people to mark off two or more races on the various forms, not just the census. This actually worked, again, across all levels of government. It affects how school forms, school enrollment forms are done. When you go to the doctor's office and you start enrolling you know, for insurance or all sorts of different ways. Uh, but that's, that's why we see today uh, that in 2000, 2010, 2020, we now have what I call the multiracial census. I would just want to emphasize that it wasn't some bureaucrat that woke up one day and decided, hey, let's allow people to start marking multiple races. No, it was a lot of effort, a sustained effort, a decade worth of work to get those changes made to allow people to mark off two or more races. Now, at this point, I need to point out, though, that even though we did have a victory in 1997, I see it as really only a partial victory. Because as our guests from the census pointed out, there are two questions that ask for identity on the census and on other forms. One of them is for race, but the other one is looking at ethnicity. And they break it down into basically two groups, Hispanic and non-Hispanic or Latino and non-Latino. Sometimes you'll see forms that then further break down Latino into subgroups, such as Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, but still, it is considered an ethnicity and not a race. 
Thus, in 1997, when the OMB revised the standards to allow people to mark off multiple races, they did not check or uh, change the ethnicity question. And so even today, if you see the question, I don't know, maybe at some point we can go back and you could see a sample of the question the way it appeared in the presentation, it still asks you to state only one race, you're either, or one ethnicity, you're either Hispanic or non-Hispanic, or Latino or non-Latino. And thus, you will still not see today any official data on people that are mixed Latino and non-Latino identity. You can kind of, what I say, sneak up on the number by looking at other data. For example, how many people mark off some other race. I believe it was at one point like 97% of the people that marked off some other race also identified as some sort of Latino. And thus, in a sense, some other race has become a de facto Latino racial category, but it still doesn't quite capture it. And not everybody is using that category to express a mixed Latino and non-Latino identity. So for that reason, and many others, I created the Latinos of Mixed Ancestry or LOMA program, basically to draw attention to this issue and to try and create that community of people that have this mixed Latino identity, people such as myself, I identify as Mexican, German, Polish. But on census, <clears throat> I have to pick one as their Latino or non-Latino on the ethnicity. And then on the race question, I have to mark some other race and white and who knows what else. I'll be honest, I'm not always consistent with how I fill out these forms. So that's what the LOMA program was created for, to create that community for people to come to and raise awareness that this is a group of people that are out there and uh, things are changing. To catch us up a little more in history, in 2017, I believe, the Census Bureau did make a recommendation to the OMB to take the Latino question and the, or sorry, the ethnicity question and the race question and combine them into a single question. And this would then turn, you could think of it as turning Latino into a racial category. Although you can all, could also look the other way around and say all the racial categories become ethnic categories. So it all depends on your point of view. And I'm sure, you know, Nicholas or Rachel could probably give us some more information on that. The OMB never rendered a decision to that recommendation. So it's still pending out there. We'll see what will happen. At that time, MASC did put their support behind this recommendation to combine them into a single category, because if Latino at that point did become a racial category, they would then inherit the ability to mark off two or more races with Latino in combination with other racial groups. And it would become a lot clearer, I think, of what people are trying to express on the census when they mark off boxes such as some other race and then write in Cuban. There's been a decade's worth of data that the Census Bureau has been doing to collect this and study this. And they've been working, of course, with advocacy groups such as MASC and other Latino groups to come up with this recommendation. So we'll see what happens over the next few years, if it comes up again, if the opportunity becomes available. But I think we would find then that we would have a much clearer picture of Latino identity, how much more mixed we are. It's amazing that we were to jump in the numbers because of the methodology changes and, and others from roughly 3% to suddenly what, 10% now, I think, of the U.S. marks two or more races. But I think we would see probably an even bigger increase with these changes. So that's that's something that hopefully we can uh, uh, see some improvement on in the next couple of years. So was there anything else you asked, you wanted me to present on, Sonia, that I missed? No, I think you... you I captured that? You captured that very well. And, um, you know, thank you. Thanks for, you know, bringing us up to date in the work um, again, I, I see so many folks on this call that have just been leading the charge as well and want to make sure that, you know, they are seen um, uh, because, again, we're, we, you know, it, the multiracial community is not a monolith. You know, there's so many different uh, points of view and, and um, how they identify. And one of the questions uh, that we uh, had was, should there be a multiracial question or a box? Um, can uh, anyone talk to that point on uh, just you know, you know, adding that or 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 just having a way to say you know, how about just that box? I think that's a, a great observation, Sonia, and something that was worked on 
before my time at the Census Bureau, um, I see Susan Graham and Reginald Daniel in the audience and many others who were involved in those efforts back in the 1990s. I was a uh, much younger graduate student with a lot of hair at the time, <laughs> observing from afar and uh, very curious to understand how such a decision and discussion and debate would pan out. Uh, it's what led to me joining the Census Bureau in 2000 after the 1990s and the research that I was doing. It, it led me to, to want to be able to go to the Census Bureau and really start helping to make this data available to the public. Uh, that was a big part of the discussions and the debate in the 1990s, whether or not there should be a catch-all box labeled multiracial or with another term, or if the methodology should be to allow for the reporting of more than one race. Um, since then, we've looked at other ways to try and expand and improve upon the questions for the census. But as uh, Thomas mentioned, ultimately we have to follow what the standards are and they prescribe the check all that, I, all that apply approach. Yeah, so to piggyback then on, on what Nicholas said, first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge some of the change of the language that has come out of the census um, using the term multiracial uh, to describe the two or more population, I think is something relatively new. Before it was very technical saying two or more races, which doesn't, didn't always sit well with everybody, but uh, so that's a nice thing to see a change. I think people are starting to recognize that term. As far as the practicality though, of having a multiracial category on the census, before we even talk about that, I'd first like to mention or talk about how is this data being used? We always need to ask ourselves, what is this data being used for? And if you're ever faced with a form and someone hands it to you and asks for that information, I think you absolutely have a legitimate right to ask them, what are you going to do with this data? And then think about how you want to respond to that based on how you, what you are told. But in short, the main reason I see for ever collecting any kind of race or ethnic data is to measure levels of inequality and discrimination. And this data can also be used for enforcing some civil rights legislation. So we, with that in mind, we have to ask ourselves, what would happen to a multiracial category? If you think about it, multiracial as a term is sort of the ultimate aggregation of all the individual different responses that people can have. For example, someone who is, uh, say, of white and Asian background, would it be counted identically to someone who is, a, say, uh, Black and Latino or Native American uh, background? And that data gets confounded together. And thus, if you were trend, trying to see if there are any trends happening in inequality, you would not be able to tease out how different subgroups of people uh, might be progressing. And so by having or allowing people to mark off multiple categories, you can then disaggregate multiracial into very fine um, subgroups and really get a good picture of what is happening to different communities. If you had a multiracial box and everybody just got rolled up to that, then you would lose that ability to disaggregate the data. And it would actually make it more difficult to try and show patterns of discrimination or inequality and it actually makes it more difficult to enforce some of the civil rights laws that are out there. So if you kind of have to make a choice, which would you rather have? A multiracial category that essentially allows you to express or validate a sense of multiracial identity or would you rather have something that's disaggregated and really allows people to take advantage of you know, the civil rights protections that are available to them. If I had to pick the two, I'd pick the latter. Uh, it's not a perfect system. Anytime you have to try and fit people's identity into boxes, you're go never gonna find a perfect system because identity is too complicated, it's too fluid. Uh, people just don't not normally fit into boxes. Unfortunately, it's necessary for the purposes of data collection and legislation, but that's just unfortunately sort of the situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Thomas. I know there uh, are folks in the chat group, uh, you know, there's some the good debate happening there as well, and some folks really wanting, um, you know, to, to get more, you know, boxes. So 
uh, we'll, we'll leave room for that as well to ask those questions, any specific questions. But you brought up the point of what is this data used for? And so besides, you know, some of the, uh, you know, policymakers and uh, using the census data, I'd like to bring in um, Stacy de Armas, who is also using this information. Um, and we'd love to hear how Nielsen uh, uses this information and your role uh, in the organization. Thank sure, you. sure. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Rachel and Nicholas, it's so great to um, meet you both virtually and hear you speak. We talk about your data all the time, so it's, it's an honor to be here with you and Thomas, um, an honor to hear about the work you're doing at LOMA. And I'm, I'm glad for that intro, Sonia, because as, as I was sitting here, you, you took exactly my notes that I wrote down, which are, um, I think when people think of census data often, they, always, they organize around um, policymaking and appropriations and schools and, and uh, you know, health services and firefighters and, you know, how we understand uh, different communities around the, the attributes of those communities and who the demographics and socioeconomics so that we can better plan for, um, you know, community. But the other major user of census data is um, businesses, right? Business, every business, and I, I always like to say there is not a business, large or small, that doesn't make some decision any given day on data that comes based on census, right? On uh, in, in any given day for all businesses, large and small, decisions such as um, the hours that you're gonna keep, right? What are the, what is the community you look like live in? Who are you going to serve? Um, are you going to serve up services that um, uh, include um, in-language services for Latinos, for, for Asians, for, um, are you Amazon and are you considering moving a headquarters to a specific market? What does that given market look like? What is the talent? in the market, the educational, um, you know, attributes of people that are in that market. Do you have in-language talent? There's so many decisions every day that are made on census that are outside of policy making, legislation, and um, and allocating dollars that I, I, I'm happy to be part of that community that uses census data, not only for our day-to-day -day decision making, and I really do mean day-to-day, um, but also Nielsen, as many of you know, is um, well known for our ratings data. And I say that with air quotes because we do so much more. We do social and economic research as well. Um, but our ratings data or our media data is what we're most known for. How many people watch the show? How many people watch the Super Bowl? Uh, where are people consuming content? Are they, and, and um, how many, what those people look like who are consuming the content? The way that we use uh, census data is to set forward, we use it in many ways, but one of the ways that's easiest to talk about is that we use census data to understand universe estimates, right? What the population looks like in any given market down to a block level so that we can make sure that as we're building panels of people from whom we will extract information to understand what viewership looks like, we make sure that those panels closely represent what the market looks like. So um, in this case, if we take a look at a block, block level data in Los Angeles based on census, we would know what this specific area looks like from census data. Men, women, young, old, educational status, uh, race and ethnicity, all of those things. And then we can ensure that the panel that we build, much smaller, of course, than census data, would have all of those same attributes as as you know, that given ge geographic area. And that way, when we sample, that's, that's our sample essentially. So when we take a look at what that viewership looks like, more often than not, it represents what the larger um, population would look like. So the way we like to explain it, because we don't work with a lot of data scientists every day in, in entertainment, sometimes yes, sometimes not, is that for us, it's sort of like, um, you know, you don't have to drink the whole pot of soup in order to know if it's good or not. You can take one scoop and you know, you may get some carrots and some, uh, some celery, you may not get the right balance of them, but you're going to get a good amount. And you can make an assessment of how good something tastes, or how much salt it has, or whatever from a, from a sample. So census data allows us to build those smaller samples that reflect uh, the community. And actually, we do it on a very granular level. And that question about uh, Cuban was mine, because my, my follow up question, I'm going to use this time to ask it, and maybe you'll answer it afterward, is, uh, it, there's also a question I think about country of origin somewhere in there where it's picked up maybe through through ACS. But I'm curious if someone identifies 
uh, Cuban as this case in the race box, which Rachel mentioned, uh, is there a way to, and probably not, but perhaps ascribe that back to the country of origin information elsewhere? Can that be done over an ACS? I don't know. Maybe we'll get to that. Uh, so that's how Nielsen uses census data. Of course, we use it for all of our measurement, but equally important, we use it when we think about our talent, where we're, where we're putting buildings. Um, in, increasingly today, as many people are working from home and um, the future of work looks different, we're reorganizing around you know, different markets where we've seen migration of people, new markets uh, um, where there is housing booming and people are moving to. These are all things we look back to census to better understand trends and what is, you know, what's occurring. In terms of media and entertainment, one other really cool place that we use census data around um, universe estimates and populations is to evaluate not just audiences, which is what I've talked about, who's watching what and, and who should be represented, but representation on screen. Uh, when we think about whether or not Afro-Latinos are having visibility in content or Asian Latinos or uh, Native Americans, you can only measure how visible a group is based on what the population of that community is based on census data in the U.S. So if we, we often hear things like Latinos are underrepresented on screen or um, Native Americans are, you know, are not present in, in uh, broadcast content, only in, you know, in streaming content or, or whatever the case is, we need to have census data to know what representation should look like to be able to measure whether or not there is good visibility of any given group on screen or in content. So that's one of the ways that we, one of the many, many ways we, we have our own uh, statisticians and data scientists that work specifically with census. I will also say Nielsen invested in, um, in 2020, we were uh, desperately concerned around the citizenship question. And for all the reasons I think everyone was, we were concerned it would have a um, a negative impact on, uh, on the collection of data. So we invested heavily in educating the community at the grassroots level around um, the importance of completing the census and what that data is used for um, beyond, um, you know, policymaking as, as we discuss and, and um, allocation of funds. So thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think some of the information, uh, you know, or uh, feedback that we're seeing in our community on our message boards on our I don't know if anybody still says message boards but I just did anyway uh, but on social media uh, you know they're uh, they're taking notice that there are now you know interracial couples multiracial families that they're seeing uh, there's books now being uh, made that show you know a biracial child or you know so that we know we've always been here, but now folks are actually kind of taking note and and uh, trying to kind of work with us and green light uh, green light some of the shows uh, that we're pitching. And so so uh, the work that is there, you know, is now being able to be captured through some of the data that you're that you're referencing. So thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple of comments. Um, uh, in the feed about uh, sh somebody shares a Wendy Roth uh, who has a multiple uh, is a resource. So I want to take you know have folks take a look at the chat that's going on because some really good stuff is being shared. Um, and thank you to our panelists who are answering questions over there. So we got you guys working. Thank you. I'd love to add one thing if I could, Sonia. If that's okay. Please. Uh, one area that is really important for us, and I think um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's moving quicker than, um, than I think we can keep up with them. And I say we, I mean uh, identity researchers, race and ethnicity researchers, is, um, is I identity, right? how people are identifying, um, and, and both gender identity and, um, uh, and sexual orientation. And so I know census has, there's, I think the Pulse survey or whatever, the, the new one that I'm sure both of you know what I'm talking about. Um, and there was some, some dialogue around the, the basis of those questions, perhaps coming from Williams Institute and the set of questions that are asked there, perhaps, you know, needing to, needing to be a little more progressive. But what I'd like to bring forward to here is, you know, this is evolving much more quicker than I think uh, much this is evolving more quickly than I think we uh, have been able to keep up with. And I say that with 
respect entirely. We we see it at Nielsen. We have, you know, we are um, reorganizing our questions around uh, gender identity and sexual orientation, and we want to look to census and say, let's do what census does. That's you know, and, and we also recognize well some of the work that's being done there also needs to make the same kind of progress that we need to make. And so, you know, I, I guess for those that are that are in the audience, there are. Um, if you see, or you, you know, that, that there isn't a universe estimate for LGBTQ, there isn't a universe estimate yet or a population, uh, you know, defined for people who have defined themselves as gender fluid or, or, or non-binary. What we want to tell you is we're not not thinking about it. All of us here, Nicholas thinks about it every day, so does Rachel. We're all trying to um, determine, you know, the, the best way, the right way. We're consulting, testing, we're, we have so many things, uh, even at Nielsen, that we're testing while we're waiting for, you know, what we think is our, the gold standard census to advance. We're also testing and we're coming together and we're collaborating. So we do know that there needs to be, we need to move more quickly and uh, especially around, I think, gender identity and everyone's thinking about it. And maybe, you know, perhaps Nicholas and Rachel can even offer um, a nod there or something. I know, I know that the work you're doing, uh, definitely this has to be part of it because it's, it's a part of the conversations I'm having every day. Thanks for your comments and really for that context, Stacey. I think it's really important what you brought to light. Think about the history that we talked about earlier, 1790 through 2020, a couple centuries of data collection. Race is one of the oldest questions we've had and it's changed every decade. The ways in which it's changed even in the last 10 years aren't quite where we think we need to be. Um, and that's what our research showed last decade. That's also why the results that we're talking about today really show some of these patterns that are not surprising to us, but also to many respondents who've, you know, answered the questions separately. They're asking, why are they this way? So one thing that Nielsen may be able to do that the Census Bureau is not able to do is take on explorations that really um, don't require a policy change. So we're a statistical agency. We are uh, following the, the guidance of OMB. And we made the types of question changes that we could under the two separate questions format. In a similar fashion, the research on SOGI and the Census Pulse survey uh, that's experimental work is available and being talked about. It's certainly a topic of great interest. Uh, you can also see within the administration, their support of expanding ways to improve data for equity uh, on topics such as race and ethnicity and sexual orientation, gender identity. So I think, you're right that we'll see a lot of change or questions for change in the coming years that maybe didn't happen for the last half century or more. And it's a strong point that you, know, you are working on it. You have, and and that that is its its pulse, and that's and that's what I intended to say. But of course, it's I don't know I know all the products you have, but there are, uh, you know, there's the opportunity through side products to it advance and to test and to you know, to test some of that language to maybe have a hiccup, then get something right and you hear from the community and 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 we're doing that that work as well. And I the the intention was even as I was looking at how we define Cuban, which was personal to me, I'm Cuban and I thought, wow, if anybody that I know, you know, accidentally did that and didn't do it, you know, that that's I, and I look at the growth and that's what's happening in my head. But we also have to, you know, set like kind of level set that you, you know, as researchers, you you have you're bound by what you have from OMB, and so you have to work within those guidelines. Even if your research gut is that, well, we you know this is an area we need to advance. And so I appreciate you suggesting that um, you know perhaps there's other work that can be done that can help inform some of yours. We would love to do that. I didn't know that was an option, <laughs> but uh, thank you for that too. Um, making connections, that's what we do. Uh, that is awesome. Um, we talked about, um, you know, the the history. We kind of got into the current. Um, we're going to kind of, you know, what it's been used for, the industries that it affects. We talked about with Nielsen, uh, you know, some of the things that, you know, uh, at Mass that we also work with the community. Uh, what can parents or community individuals do uh, maybe to help advocate for this community? Does anybody have any uh, suggestions on advocating for the multiracial community now that we kind of have this information? Um, and I say that because I went to uh, 
a discussion and they were, you know, touting that it was a multicultural panel. And I was like, wait, you should also have someone that identifies as multiracial on your panel. Like I felt like it was incomplete if, you know, so I guess I'm asking on a kind of, uh, basic level, prime level, what would, what could folks do just as individuals now that they have this information? And I'll open that to anyone. I'd suggest um, that folks can continue to raise their voices because, you know, individ as individuals, it is, um, it's, it's, you know, to be perfectly honest, it's, it's difficult to make, a, you know, a lot of change. But I think if we raise our voices to organizations like Thomas is part of, right, like your, Sonia, your organization, that really can advocate and lobby for, um, you know, diverse communities data being collected in a new way, that's, you know, perhaps uh, one of the best things that um, the individuals can do, right, they can continue to elevate their voice in their, um, uh, the demand to be seen in the way that that uh, you know questioning is taking place today. As we were um, advancing the the topics that I suggested around gender identity and and uh, sexual orientation, uh, even having the conversations, you know, keeping bringing the topics up about you know uh, multiracial, uh, whatever the topic is. The truth is, even in the rooms that I was in, all of us have been exposed. Every one of us on this call, I would argue, and on this panel, has been exposed to a question in the past, you know, two weeks, I'll even put a time limit on it, three weeks, where you were asked uh, your your gender identity and there was a new category that you didn't see that wasn't there three years ago, right? Every one of us has had that experience recently. And so that tells me that that dialogue, that narrative is advancing. And so it is important because we're seeing it already in, in things I fill out for my kids for school and things I've been asked to fill out. And so that didn't come though from the top down, right? That came from the bottom up. And that is the power, I think, in individuals continuing to advocate for being seen is eventually, you know, in this case, it's kind of going to filter up. And I would imagine or expect that in the next, you know, the next census, which um, is, you know, quite some, some way out 10 years off still that we will have, as Nicholas suggested, we do every 10 years, you know, new questions and um, new ways of getting to the bottom of, you know, complex identity or, or race and ethnicity questions. Uh, by way of the bottom up, so mm -hmm. that would be my suggestion. Stacy, I really, I, I really like your points there, and I think from a perspective of what I'd, I've seen over the past twenty years with researching and collecting and working to provide data on the multiracial population, it's certainly a very similar perspective in that the the discussions that we're having today are not the same as they were ten years ago. They're certainly very different from the first data being released in two thousand, and then if you go back to the 1990s and earlier, the lack of data meant there were also very, very different discussions. So I think it's mm -hmm. it's that information that becomes powerful, but also the stories that people are able to tell and bring to light. You know, there's numbers out there, but when you have stories from individuals who speak to some of the questions that we had in the audience today, I did this and why is it this way? That's what's leading change. And it's coming from those stories and from those individuals. Yeah, I'd like to add, too, for people trying to self-advocate, step one, I would say, is first educate yourself. And I think many of the people who are participating in this uh, call right now that are attending today are taking those first steps in educating themselves on the issues, getting to know their rights, um, you know, what, what, are, what are the policies out there that are dictating this thing and where things need to be changed. Um, and then also you can join MASK's newsletter. We have a newsletter that goes out a couple times a month, keep you informed about what's happening in the mixed race community, especially. You can also follow us on social media. We have, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So those are also ways for you to make yourself aware. And then when, once you understand what your rights are and what the policies are, you can then, like I said earlier, question when you get these forms handed to you and ask them what are you going to do with this data if they can't give you a good answer then you know you should maybe raise their awareness take that time or reach out to a group like mask and tell us about what's happening to you so that we can then share your story or spread your story and maybe even approach some of these agencies um, with change uh, 
just to remind, uh, something that I missed earlier today was, earlier in my talk, was that California passed a law recently that said by January 1st of 2022, any agency that reports data to the state of California must allow people to mark off more, one or more race or ethnicity. Okay, they did not limit it to just race. They also said ethnicity. They must allow multiple responses. And then those agencies, when they report out data, they must report out um, individual race or, or sole standalone race, race in combination, and then also two or more races. And so we put together a study called um, Half Measures. You can find it on mixedracestudies.org. Go to that website, mixedracestudies.org, search for the study Half Measures, and that'll give you a, a an overview of what we looked at some major agencies, school districts, uh, police departments, things like that, and how they are reporting data and whether they are yet in compliance with California state law. Guess what we discovered? Nobody is currently in compliance with California state law. Exactly. So by the time we get to January 1st of next year, there's going to have to be some sort of reckoning at some point in time. Yeah, Thomas, that was going <clears> to <throat> kind of be my point in the last year. I have run across that uh, agencies as well as the private sector <clears throat> do not often allow the multi-choice. They play poverty, that they don't have the money to upgrade their software. And of course, if it's electronic, the system will not allow you. You do not have options unless you choose other, which I find very frustrating. Um, you know, old paper, I, you know, I ignore the instructions and do my multi-check. Um, but in the electronic age, you don't have that option. And it's very frustrating. Uh, yeah, agreed. Thank you, Iman, for, for sharing that. And um, yeah, so you would think software, it's a, some coding updates. You just added the ability to check off multiple boxes. I mean, it's, it can be done. There's no reason it can't be done. It's just a database change, software change. Um, you know, so that's something for us to look at uh, Thomas, it, future, it, future change. It probably stems from people's lack of understanding, I think, if even, the, I mean, the we all know this, we do this every day, but the basic lack of understanding of the difference between race and ethnicity. I mean, that's probably part of it is, that, I mean, that's the simplest thing, like, we're, we, you know, that's a, for us, it would be a, a joke over dinner. We would laugh at, at some race and ethnicity, ha, ha, good. But the truth is, as I get, you know, further outside of the research circle, there is a very, there's a lack of understanding around those basics, or at least those basics around the guardrails that as they're presented through census and, you know, and as they're defined by OMB. And we've been talking today about moving, you know, Hispanic to, uh, you know, yeah. to race. I, I have to be honest, over here, I'm not, I don't sit in this work every day. It gave me like the chills. I thought, how could we possibly do that? We'd have to change because Hispanic isn't a race. It's an ethnicity. And I, and this is, and there's only so many races. And I, but I'm also, you know, keep, I'm um, bound, I, I'm bound by, uh, the, you know, the, the way we have grown up thinking about this. And perhaps that is our greatest challenge. Yeah. Which is really it's, breaking that down and allow I mean, multiracial is to me a no brainer. That seems easy, but but I think that that's for us, right? Outside of us and the people that are administering this data, they're not all data analysts. They're not statisticians. They don't have the data science background that that many people have. And not to I'm not saying anything um, uh, negative about that work at all. But they're you know doing their best. I think every, every their best to follow along with the guidelines, but there is a, a, a perhaps an educational opportunity there. Yeah, you know, I, the joke I like to crack though is if you ask 10 different people the definition of race, you'll get 10 different answers. It's funny how we live our lives and we make some really important decisions based on these general assumptions that we all understand these terms and have the same definitions, but in fact, we really don't. They are social constructs and they are very different and that's, the challenge that the Census Bureau and Nielsen and, and all of us have when we're trying to fill out these boxes, how to design these forms in these boxes when everybody has, you know, very unique and different understandings. So how do we find, you know, the, the least common denominator of understanding amongst people that can yield meaningful data for people? That's a challenge. 
People want to identify, I think, also often, at least in our work, by by their country of origin, by their ethnicity. You know, there's a comfort level with me identifying as Cubana rather than identifying as Hispanic, you know, especially as we start to think about breaking down, you know, sort of some systemic barriers or, you know, they like Hispanic, you know, wasn't, wasn't, a, it was a term that was invented by census and maybe, but Latino doesn't include Spain. And, there, you know, I feel like the more we, um, we, we, we march along and learn, the more complex it becomes. Mm -hmm. And Stacey and Thomas, a lot of our work last decade really dug into those complex concepts to understand what they mean to people. We had a series of focus groups across the country that fed into the designs that we tested. And you're right, the, the answers that people, the, the ways that people conceptualize this are different. And that's something that we've been challenging for the federal standards to try and find a better way to ask questions that reflect the ways that most people are changing their understandings of these concepts. There's not going to be a perfect question, but there's certainly ways that we can make improvements on the ones that we have. And that's what our research has shown. Well, that's a perfect segue to what is next. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you're not, uh, what's next, Rachel, uh, for the census, as far as, you know, what's coming up, what should we be aware of? What should, um, uh, as we're waiting for any questions from the audience, uh, please raise your hand uh, or put them in the uh, box here in the chat box. I'm going to drop some of our links to our website and our social media pages that Thomas uh, pointed out. Um, but Rachel, share with us, you know, uh, bring us into the next uh, few years uh, as we mm -hmm. get ready for uh, the next uh, census. Yeah, that is a really great question. And, you know, truthfully, we are still in the middle of the 2020 census, believe it or not. So we, you know, we released the apportionment data. And now today we talked about the redistricting data, but that's really our first data product, you know, with actual data about the population in it. You know, we have a, a series of data products that we traditionally put out after the redistricting product, and we're planning to put out similar data products for the 2020 census. Um, you know, actually, you know, some of the use, the ways that you all used your data that you were talking about earlier uh, really made me think about, you know, this, this call, we're doing a, a call for today users to tell us how to use the data in the, in the decennial data products. Um, and so I, I think we'll pass that information along to you because we'd really love to learn more about how exactly you're using these data. Um, so we have planned, uh, you know, our, what we call their demographic and housing characteristics file. If you're familiar with 2010 products, it used to be called the summary file one, but now we have, you know, much longer name. Um, and that file will include data for the multiracial population population, but it'll include population and housing characteristics for that population. So we're really excited about that, but we do want to learn more about how people are using that as we continue to finalize that product. And then later on, we're also going to have um, a replacement file for the, what was known in 2010 as the Summary File 2 and the American Indian and Alaska Native Summary File. Um, and that's where we'll produce data for those detailed groups groups like Cuban, like Navajo Nation, um, German, Irish, uh, you know, Nigerian. And, you know, for the first time ever, we'll have data on the detailed white and black groups and, you know, the alone groups and then also the aloner in combination groups as well. Um, so we're excited about that. But again, we really want to learn how people um, will use that data. So that's, that's what we have coming out. Um, and then, of course, we'll also be, you know, working to develop our research plans as we move toward the 2030 census and continue to dig into the data that we have right now. Thank you. Uh, that is perfect. Uh, let's see here. Someone asked, what happened to the MENA category? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so, uh, as I'm, it sounds like you're very familiar with, uh, a lot of the research we did throughout the decade to test the Middle Eastern and North African or the MENA category, um, there was a lot of support for the, from the community to test this category, it was decades worth of work uh, to test this category. Um, so we tested it leading up to the 2020 census. Um, we did find throughout our research that, um, as we mentioned earlier, that a combined question with the MENA category did provide more accurate data for respondents, including those who are Middle Eastern and North African. Um, but because we do have to follow the 1997 OMB standards, 
which state that Middle Eastern and North African respondents are part of the white racial category, we weren't able to move forward with that category. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, as we move forward with our plan, our research plans for 2030, um, you know, we are still interested in pursuing that category. So, since following our research, we did show that it produced more accurate data for MENA respondents. Thank you. All right, it is open. Uh, anyone have a question for the panel? All right, I shared a couple of uh, messages uh, in our um, in the chat on how to contact mask and the work that we are doing. Um, we bring these uh, panels to you. Uh, we are a small but mighty uh, volunteer board. Uh, and I see some of our board members here on the call. Uh, so I want to thank them for uh, for uh, the work that they are doing and um, also share with you some of the projects that we have. Um, we have a coloring book that is uh, absolutely wonderful that is going to give folks a way to, there it is, thanks Thomas, um, take a look at that, sign up to our newsletter and, um, you know, make sure that we, we're taking that information. Thomas loves this stuff. Uh, so he makes sure that it's in our newsletter. I think he has a direct line to Nicholas and Rachel. Uh, so look out, you are going to be, you know, uh, BFFs for sure. Um, and to Stacy, thank you for taking uh, the work that uh, and the information that uh, that the census has provided us with the data and really trying to make sure that our numbers and our community are uh, being uh, represented. I see a hand from Carlos. Um, please uh, unmute yourself and um, let us know. Unmuted. Hi. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos Cortez. I'm a, a retired history professor at the University of California, Riverside. And just a year ago, I was hired uh, by the, our School of Medicine to come out of retirement and work in developing a new, uh, uh, new curriculum in health equity, social justice, and anti-racism. And what interests me about today's conversation uh, connected to that is how much of medical decision making, including the coding of instruments that are used to test people and come out with the results and on which medical decisions are based, use race and use ethnicity. And the issues that are raised here today really complicate that fact. Uh, and there's a, there's a tremendous controversy going on right now. And, uh, and so the issue you're talking about is not just about identity. It's about human lives. And I got to express a fear. The more that we claim our racial data is good, the more it encourages people like uh, the medical profession to use the data as good. And when you confuse identity with heritage, with one, you know, the blood that's coming down and the genetics that's coming down, it could be that we end up unintentionally killing people by simply yeah. encouraging. And they haven't got, even got a thing in medicine now they call the uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, discount uh, or ethnic adjustments. And a lot of this is based on data which, quite honestly, to me, seems quite spurious. So I'm just going to throw this out as, as, as sort of a concern. This is not just about this is not just about identity, folks. This is about human lives. I'll sign off. Car Carlos, from your lips to God. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Carlos. Good to see you again. It's been a while. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thank you for joining in our call. And thank you for bringing that up. I actually work in the medical device industry. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. That's my full-time job. This is all volunteer, like Sonia mentioned earlier. But I definitely do see um, some of the data that's coming down. Um, clinical trials, for example, um, they've been trying to diversify clinical trials as much as they can to help, one, to help make sure that it's equitable the way the treatments go out, but also to make sure that they capture all the different 
um, ethnic and racial differences that might affect the way um, um, you know therapies and medicines and things uh, are delivered and devices as well. Um, but there's a there's definitely a real danger there. Race is a social construct. There's no genetic or biological basis to it. So how can you really draw really strong conclusions on about medical data, depending how uh, somebody responds? Uh, for example, I, I like to, I think if this is like the Barack Obama factor. You know, people asked uh, Barack Obama back in 2010 what his race was, and you know, what he marked down on race, and he said it was black. When we all know that he had a white mother. Well, imagine if he were participating in a medical study. Okay, all the data that would be collected about him would have been attributed entirely to his blackness and none of it to his whiteness because of how he responded to the form, because trust me, when they enroll people into these uh, uh, medical studies, uh, clinical trials, they, they use forms that have these boxes on them that look very similar to what the Census Bureau and Nielsen and everybody else is doing. So you have to be very careful about drawing biological conclusions based on race. Now, if you wanna collect that data to try and show social inequities like, you know, are, are black people being delivered healthcare the same way that white people are, et cetera, then that would be a very legitimate use for collecting race data in relation to medical data. But if you try to start making really strong uh, biological conclusions, you are in very uh, dangerous territory and I would caution against anybody doing that. So I, I'm with you about anyone that's really trying to draw strong biological conclusions about race from any medical, any medical data. Yeah, I think that's a, thank you for bringing that up, uh, both of you. And I think, you know, in the last couple of minutes that we have, you know, I, I definitely want to keep this conversation going, follow us on social media, ask these questions um, as well, share your perspectives. Um, I think it's, you know, for everything that has the positive, we need to also be concerned of, you know, some of the other uh, uh, ways that folks are using this information. So thank you for bringing that up uh, as well. Uh, I do want to close um, and be respectful of your time and let you know that MASK uh, does have two events coming up. We'd love for you to join us. Uh, we have some yoga story time and we have uh, an author who is going to be doing a, uh, a book reading and a Q&A. Uh, so be on the lookout for those on our social media page, please. Um, we have a, uh, like I said, our, our team um, looking out for events like this that we can put on. Um, I want to thank again um, Thomas, uh, Nicholas, Stacy, and Rachel for giving so much of your time and not only what happened behind the scenes and prep and um, and of your uh, your uh, the amount of you know brain trust we had on this call was uh, absolutely amazing. So uh, with that. Uh, I'll let you each uh, say uh, goodbye and we'll just uh, uh, end from there. If, they, if you want to give any uh, information, final, you know, shout outs, I don't know, uh, websites, how they can find you, uh, how they could stay involved if there's any other way. Uh, I'll give you that opportunity now. I was, uh, Thomas, I, uh, I gave some, I dropped some uh, links in our page. Um, please be, uh, I mentioned again, we're, we're volunteer if you would like to donate uh, to MASK. Uh, we are always um, uh, very grateful for that. Nicholas, how about you? Not with donations. Thanks, uh, Sonia. <laughs> no, <laughs> how about you donate, Nicholas? No. <laughs> uh, if well, you can share any uh, final thoughts and, and sign off, uh, thanks. Well, I would just say it's a pleasure to be here and, and donating our time and, and our energy to advance this conversation is a privilege for us. Uh, we also take it as a great responsibility. So we thank you for inviting us to the dialogue. And I would just encourage all of your connections to check out the information that we shared, You know, see how it syncs with what you see on the ground when you're looking at census data, what you know about your communities and your cities and your states, and also understand how things are changing, but we still have a long way to go to uh, continue to improve these measurements and ensure that people understand what comes from them 
and hopefully it's changing the conversation. One thing that I really like to think about is the work that Rachel and I and our colleagues did with the 2020 census results is that it's raised a lot of questions for people, not just at the policy level, but at the dinner table. And I think that that's an important thing for us to keep having this dialogue. So thanks for inviting us. Isn't that wonderful? That is an, a, yes, thank you. How about you, Rachel? Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting us. You know, this is, you know, Nicholas and I always talk about this is really the best part of the work that we do coming out and talking to people about the data, you know, that wouldn't be possible without this constant back and forth conversation. Um, one thing I will do want to say is, you know, this conversation doesn't end here, it keeps going. And every little bit of communication, you know, on the ground, even with or without us, even tweets about, you know, the multiracial population tweets or, you know, messages to us, we, we read all of that. So, you know, when I think about when we were planning for the 2020 census and we were developing our code list, we looked to Twitter, we looked at comments people were giving us to talk about, you know, the new ways they were identifying. So all of that work, um, you know, even if it might seem like it's just a little bit of effort to type something on your phone, all of that matters and it really does inform our work. So um, I just wanted to, you know, shout that out that, um, you know, all of it matters. We, we read it all and we really appreciate all of it. So we really look forward to uh, hearing more from you all. Thank you. Uh, Stacy. I will keep it brief because we all I have I have some child care responsibilities. I'm sure others do, too. Uh, I added a link to our most recent report that we released um, uh, just last week. And that one specifically is on the Latino community. But we do definitely take on um, diversity uh, and sort of breaking down the monolith. So we talk about Afro Latinos, Asian Latinos, something we hadn't done before. Uh, we have a lot of diverse insights and all of our work is increasingly intersectional because we recognize that we all are too. It's all free. You can use any of it, all of it. This particular piece does reference uh, some of the work um, from Nicholas and Rachel's organization. We, of course, always start with some census data. So hopefully I got it right. Cause it's, so it's my research. So if it's wrong, please let me know. I'm actually thinking now I should have looked at and in combination because of the way, but well, We'll talk about it offline, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you soon. Recording will be uh, ending soon. We'll just gather it and we'll be able to share this recording with you as well. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, there's so much. Uh, 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 we're, we're very grateful. Thank you for your time. We'll see you next time. Adios. Adios. Bye. Bye.